there will be never a resolution to that issue. So uh, let us, I think, you know, human beings, I think the Buddhist, there is a teaching of love, a lot of teaching of love. Let us work on the commonality of humanity, not on our differences. Don't be suspicious, don't be prejudiced. Let us try to see that. There's enough space in Myanmar. You know, I mean, I'm not saying that if there is no space, I can understand. But there is enough space in Myanmar to accommodate everyone, to accommodate inclusiveness in democracy, human rights, and all sorts. So uh, I, I think we need to, if there is, uh, but I don't know if there is practical, I think there is a need for the United Nations to get involved, the international community to get involved, and see that Myanmar has to perform, has to perform this part. But it may not be practical, but I think that's the only way. Otherwise, you will not have the Rohingya issue resolved and it will be here for a long, long time. And uh, I think until that, that issue, when everyone will uh, slowly forget its importance and forget the burden that has been carried by Rohingya, by the uh, Bangladesh government. So thank you. That's a short introduction. Thank you very much.
being generated by our dear neighbor. So that's where we have to look at. Do not deviate from the focus. I was, uh, there were a couple of issues that I will, I will deal with it. First, with the local integration. And I'm very happy that uh, our distinguished uh, minister from Malaysia, the former minister, has, has rightly pointed out that uh, local integration could be an option, but is it a preferred, morally acceptable option or not? It is certainly not. Where was the accountability? This is where we possibly have made mistakes in the past. They have came in 78, 79. We thought that we will settle it by returning this 200,000. We did. Then they came again in 92 and 93. And we again thought that uh, you know, we will be able to solve it. But we almost ignored the whole issue of accountability, the justice, the abuses that have taken place in Myanmar. And the result is that now we are facing a bigger problem. So what is the bigger problem? It is a very complex, fast-changing problem, both for Rohingyas and for Bangladeshis. That is why we were so concerned. It's a formidable challenge. He said, you know, we started off thinking it's a humanitarian crisis. People are leaving and they will go back the way it happens in China. So the Prime Minister decided to open the border and welcome them so that, you know, they can be looked after, him, protected, and then at an appropriate moment, we, we send them back. And that is why in November we went to Myanmar to find a solution through bilateral deals. But look what has happened. All agrees that they have to go back. We were in different countries. And they said, oh, there is a strong political will in Myanmar to take them back. Of course, there is a strong political will uh, in Myanmar. But if you look at the reports, both internationals and some of the reports that has recently come out of Australia and Canada, they are actually buying time. Somebody already did mention. So under these circumstances, what kind of solution that we are looking at? And uh, as I said, that we are not looking at local integration. Now, what Bangladesh did in terms of, since in the policy for Lukyam, I'll, I'll share as to how we uh, gradually upgraded our response, policy response to the issue. First, we thought it's a humanitarian issue. Immediately, we realized after seeing this unfortunate group of people that it's a human rights issue. One year into the history, we realize it is a geopolitical issue. So it is a mix of human rights issue, humanitarian issue, and a geopolitical issue. It is indeed taking shape where geopolitics of this region will go through fundamental changes. You know, this is an academic environment I will share with you. Because of the Rohingya crisis, of Foreign policy has gone through twisted turns. Things that we are doing now, we have never done in the past. That is what is happening to Bangladesh. It is not only in terms of environment, it is not in terms of burden, but in terms of very nature of the state is going through that change. That's where the solution lies. So this time when we realize that it is a fluid situation, it is a huge atrocity that has taken place. And it reminded us of 1971. I don't know how many of you were born in those days, but I, as a young kid, had seen a uh, full of dead bodies. It always reminds me of 1971. That's how I see them, 1971. So I said, we were possibly unfortunate that nobody came forward to look at our genocide. Why not we at least try and get a justice for this group of people if something has gone wrong? So, we decided, and our Prime Minister agreed, after long discussions, that we will take it to the international forum, the highest international forum. And that's what she did. In the UNG, she made a statement that this is ethnic cleansing. We didn't say genocide. We said ethnic cleansing, so keep the response uh, to its limit. 
and also five point plan, and we, we try and get support from the multilateral bodies. There wasn't many or much. Uh, my IUM colleague has already mentioned that how UN had utterly failed in Myanmar to stop this atrocities. Now there's a report available. You can go and read it, and that uh, things could have been better if UN would have taken precautionary steps. Now, we have not kept our policies only confined to the UN. We realized that possibly Security Council would not be able to have a united voice to bring in a resolution and a punitive action. So, when the ICC, International Court of Criminal Court, decided so motto that they would like to use their jurisdiction, 1903, although Myanmar is not a party, and came to Bangladesh, we had a long debate. You know, I, I, I sometimes listen to the talk shop, uh, talk shop in the, uh, in the television and realize that I wish I could go in public and tell them that what we have been doing for so long. Because people think that we are inactive, we are not. So we had a long debate within ourselves. Should we allow ICC to come in and look at these atrocities or not? And finally, the Prime Minister decided, looking at our 71 uh, story, that we will allow ICC to come in. So ICC has already established its jurisdiction. So that is the question of accountability. And it's not easy for a state to allow ICC to come in and look at the non-judicial state. Not only that, there was a name of Gambia, uh, rather very loosely. But Gambian government has decided that they will also take Myanmar to the ICJ, to the OIC process. They're bringing a whole lot of a case against the uh, state for committing genocide. As you know, the ICC looks at individuals' international crime, and ICJ looks at states' international crime. So there are multiple ways we are trying to bring a sustainable solution. Because that's how I think the state of Myanmar would realize that they cannot get away doing this again, again, and again. Now, there were some uh, pessimists. There will always be pessimists in the world. I'm more optimistic, uh, but not unrealistic optimism. And the Honorable Minister rightly pointed out a very pragmatic way of addressing it. We know that this burden will be with us for a while. Okay? And we will gladly take care of that burden. And by doing it, we will also establish a new name for Bangladesh. The Bangladesh doesn't shy away when it comes to international peace, just in accountability issues. That is very fundamental in our foreign policy. Uh, in terms of impact, I'll be very happy to uh, um, answer your questions. Uh, in terms of impact, the impact has been very fundamental, whether in the economy, whether in the social cultural matrix of that area, or our foreign policy, or climate change. We have to bear it. And as a nation, I think we can do that. Because nobody else did it for us in 1971. I wish some countries stood up and said that, you know, something has gone fundamentally wrong in the is Pakistan, in Bangladesh. People need to look at it. Nobody did. So at least we should not shy away from, from doing it. Uh, In, in our international relations in the foreign policy making, we, when we cannot describe a situation, we say it's a fluid. The Myanmar, Bangladesh, Rohingya issue is a fluid situation. And dealing with the fluid situation is extremely challenging and difficult. And that is why sometimes we cannot answer to your questions. Because by answering your questions, we don't want to reveal what strategy that will be taking in the next UNGA, or for that matter when ICC really takes up the case and establish an office in Bangladesh. 
But I can assure you, especially my younger uh, colleagues, that the government of Bangladesh, under the leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, has been very proactive in this area. We have done things which many states have tried it. With their questions, I'll be very happy to answer. Thank you. Now, uh, we have the floor is open. You can ask a question. Please let us know exactly for whom this question is specific. So that the respondent can come up forward very precise to us that you expect. The floor is open and we'll continue. Could you just uh, introduce yourself and make a specific question and for whom? Yeah. Right. I'm a student of LSU. I'm Afra. So in the keynote speech, we heard that we need to get to the root cause to get to any solution, right? To the extent of our knowledge, the ethnic cleansing sprung from intolerance of the Rohingya community in Myanmar. So my question is that we've always worked along the lines of sanctions or military involvement when it comes to solving this kind of problems in foreign soil. But is there any way the international bodies can influence an organic change in Myanmar to tackle this root problem of intolerance? Thank you very much. So I think it will come again. I stated it in many public or mass media. And <clears throat> who want to stay here, they have been habituated with these situ uh, surroundings of Bangladesh. Many of the families are comfortable enough to call this place their home. What is the plan, uh, what is the plan about them? Would they be given a choice to take whether they can stay here and take part in the population mainstream of Bangladesh or they will be staying back to Rakhine State again? Thank you. Uh, we know that uh, because of the Rohingya impact, there are a lot of environmental implications. So what the global regimes are doing on it and our national strategy to recover the environmental destruction. Please. I'm Khatun. I'm Associate Professor of Jahangir University. My question is to the Foreign Secretary, Mr. Shekhar uh, It is understandable that the repatriation is the most important concern for Bangladesh. But the reality is we are having uh, Rohingya for, for more than four decades. So when uh, we are uh, operating the programs for Rohingya, uh, for example, for education and uh, their uh, ability to to go to work and earn for themselves instead of feeding Rohingya for decades. So, is there any uh, uh, mid-term uh, plan from the government to tackle the issue instead of the ad hoc short-term uh, programs. Thank you very much. My name is Mohammed Sharif al and I'm a student of NSU. Uh, sir, my question would be that we, both, we all know that Myanmar is bordered with two big nations who, who play a major role in the world. One is India and the other is China. Now, we haven't seen a lot of action from both these nations when it comes to the, the main problems of Myanmar. And another thing is that in most cases, China has not actually spoken a lot about Myanmar. And uh, also that in case there's proof of genocide, and if there's like any national crisis of defense regarding uh, the, this whole issue, how would Bangladesh tackle it? I mean, Bangladesh is bound to answer to both the nations like China and India, because we are very good allies with China.